Good morning. I guess everybody got to be seated but me. I'll learn that cue eventually. How's everybody this morning? Hey, let's make a deal. I'm just going to be who I am and y'all just be who you are and we'll get along good this morning. Is that fair? Can we do that? Somebody asked me earlier this morning, are you nervous? I said, well, listen, anytime you open God's word to share with God's people, you ought to be nervous because you're undertaking a holy task. So there's going to be a few nerves, but I tell you, I'm probably not as nervous as some of you are because I was looking at some of you a minute ago when you were singing and man, some of the looks on some of y'all's faces, y'all were looking at the choir and well, y'all were worried about them dancing. I saw you. <laughs> hey, I got news for you though. When we get to heaven, there's going to be a party going on. So let's practice now. I'm not saying start jumping the chairs. Don't think that now. Well, first of all, let me tell you, we've had a great time being with you all this weekend. It's been wonderful. We got to our room up in Rome Thursday evening and checked in, and somebody, the, the, the clerk there at the desk said, hang on, there's something for you, and they brought us this edible arrangements, and so I think you won my wife's heart at that point because it was uh, chocolate-dipped fruit, and so I, I'm pretty sure you won the hearts of my wife and my children at that point, and then we've... Uh, gotten to spend some time at Stone Mountain on Friday and got to hang out with some others yesterday and drive around the area and so we've had a wonderful time so your hospitality has been absolutely wonderful and we've, uh, we've appreciated that and so thank you. You know have you ever had those moments in life where something happens and man things seem to be going really really well you think that things are going amazing and then you get that you come to that point where maybe it's you get some news and everything stops you in your track. Anybody had a moment like that? Come on, I know you're Baptist. You can raise your hands. Go ahead. Um, I got to tell you, a few years ago, I was on staff at a church. In fact, the name of the church may sound familiar to some of you. I was on staff at First Baptist Church of Lawton, Oklahoma. I was the youth pastor there, and I, and I went on staff as a youth pastor, and man, things were going amazingly well. In fact, they were going so well, we got ready for our Disciple Now weekend, and they said, now Grady, our attendance has been kind of low, and, and so I don't know what you're going to have. We had our Disciple Now weekend, and we had a significant number of students, and it kind of shocked me that we had that many, and it shocked some other people too, and I sent several people to Sam's to buy more food because we didn't have near enough. I believe if you want to get a crowd, if you put out food, yeah. it worked for Jesus, I'm just saying. But anyhow, we, we had a great time, and, and then we walked on through the spring with our spring activities, and we got to, to summer camp. Churches in Oklahoma, the majority of them go to a summer camp called Falls Creek. Falls Creek is the largest youth camp in the entire world. In the course of a summer, there will be between 55 and 65,000 students go through that camp. Falls Creek is huge. I mean, it is huge. Outside of the summer, it's a ghost town. But during those eight weeks of summer, man, it is an amazing place. In fact, more International Mission Board missionaries come through Falls Creek than anywhere else. They surrender to the ministry there. And so we got ready for Falls Creek that year, and my wife and I had sold our house in Texas, and we had bought a house in Oklahoma, and the way our summer schedule worked, we had about a three-day window that we could go to Texas and get all of our belongings and move them back and get them into our new home before our summer craziness started. And so we had our parent meeting, you know that meeting that you have to have to tell the parents the same thing you tell them every year? Don't do this, don't do this, if you do this we're sending you home, that, that meeting. We had our parent meeting and when we had our parent meeting it kind of shocked me, we had it in a little kind of a foyer room in one of our facilities there and I thought That'll be a big enough room. I was wrong. People kept coming in. And I thought somebody had died because I hadn't seen that many people since a funeral. We, we left after that meeting that night. My wife and I left and drove back to Texas. And on the way back to Texas, she's counting the registrations. And when she got to 140, I got worried because the cabin we rented only slept 150. They had not had this problem before, and so it's midnight. I called our pastor and said, hey, we got a problem. He said, what? I said, I stopped counting at 160. And he said, that is a problem. He said, I guess you better find another cabin. Let me explain to you how this works at Falls Creek. There are churches who literally stay on waiting lists for years to get a cabin. I had eight days to find one. So the next morning, I got up early and... I had some students at my former church come and help me load because that's what youth pastors do. When we move, we find kids that we used to like and have them help, come help us. And so uh, 
And then they don't like us anymore because they realize we got too much junk. But anyway, I, I had some kids, and so they were carrying furniture out, and I'm on the telephone from like 7 in the morning until finally, a little before noon, I found a church literally three doors down, or a cabin three doors down from our cabin. I, three doors down. I think I heard that in some music one time. <laughs> anyway, it was like three doors down, and I... I got, they, were, they had a vacancy. The church that had, that had rented it for that week had called and canceled, and they didn't know what they were going to do because they needed the income. It was a small church. And I said, well, I'll tell you what. I'll rent it, and I'll pay you what you're asking for it. And they were like, it's yours. Next thing you know, we took 168 people to camp that year. Blew our minds. We had, man, people were showing up. The morning that we were going to camp, people were showing up giving me money. Hey, can my kid go to camp? Yeah, come on. Where are they going to fit? I don't know. Throw them in somewhere. So off we go to camp. Had a great time. Get to camp. Our student praise band led worship. You would have worship service, you know, in the big auditorium that seats 7,500. And then in your cabin, you would have a worship service. So we'd have worship service every night in our cabin. Our student worship band led, did a phenomenal job. It was absolutely wonderful. I'd preach one night, and then our pastor would preach one night. And, I mean, we were having kids saved. It was unbelievable. We got back from Falls Creek on Sunday evening, and, or on Saturday morning. And Sunday evening, we had Falls Creek Report Night. I think we baptized something like 12 or 15 students who had given their lives to Christ that week at Falls Creek. I mean, we were on top of the world. Things were going amazing. I had to leave later that night. I was speaking at a camp in South Texas, and so I left and took off to go to South Texas, drove most of the night. The third time I fell asleep, I figured it was time to pull over and get a motel room. So about 4 o'clock, I pulled over and got a hotel room, got up the next morning, drove on into the camp I was speaking at, spoke all week, and while I was speaking, I called some of my students because I got back on Saturday, and on Sunday, we were leaving to go to Colorado on a mission trip. I mean, it was just boom, boom, boom. Things were going crazy, but it was amazing. All of my students who were going on the mission trip took complete ownership of the mission trip. I told them what we were going to be doing. They divided the responsibilities out among themselves. So the week I was speaking at a camp, I came back on Saturday. One of the students called me and said, Grady, we got it all squared away. Don't worry. When a high school student tells you we've got it all squared away, don't worry, <laughs> you, don't, you can't help but immediately you worry. So Sunday morning, I got to church real early, and come to find out, the kid was telling the truth. They had, it all, they had it all squared away and worked out. I'm talking who was doing the crafts at the vacation Bible school, who was teaching the Bible stories, who was doing the music. They had it all worked out. They had loaded the trailer. It was amazing. We went on that mission trip to Colorado, got back. Saw several, while we were there, we saw several people give their lives to Christ. Got back from the mission trip. Our family took off on a family vacation. It was absolutely wonderful. We came back from that vacation, though, and about two weeks later, while things were still going good, I had to go, I had to go back to Texas to help do a funeral for a family member. About 1 o'clock in the morning, I got a phone call. It was my wife. Now, sometimes my wife talks in her sleep just a little. <laughs> and sometimes if she doesn't eat or drink, enough, her blood sugar drops, and she kind of acts a little goofy. Now, I'm not talking bad about her. At least she has an excuse. I don't know what my problem is. But she called me about 1 o'clock in the morning, and something wasn't right. She was trying to explain to me what was going on. I was six hours away. I couldn't figure it out. And I said, well, just go drink you some orange juice. You'll be fine, because that's... What do we do? What do all of us non-medical people do? Drink some orange juice. You'll be fine. Isn't that the... That's the doctor's excuse, right? Drink some orange juice. Drink some more juice, you'll be fine. So the next morning, we're doing the funeral. My mother was there, and she walked up to me in between the church and the, or at the graveside. We'd moved from the church to the graveside. She walked up to me and said, hey, uh, Robin, they just called. Robin was at the doctor, and she's had a seizure. I was like, oh, my goodness. So I walked over and told my aunt. It was my uncle who had passed away. I walked over to my aunt and said, listen, I'm sorry, but I've got to go. So I jumped in the car and took off back to Oklahoma and got there and Robin began having seizures. Man, for the next six weeks, we went through this series of the doctor would give her medication to stop seizures. And every time they would adjust the medicine, she, her seizures would become more severe and more frequent. And I kept going to the doctor and I'd say, look, doc, I know I'm not a doctor and I'm not trying to tell you what to do, but you're crazy. No, I'm not. This won't cause seizures. I'm telling you, it's causing seizures. No, it's not causing them. Something else is causing them. Give her another dose. Okay, listen. I don't know how they practice medicine in Georgia, 
But if it's, I don't know what's causing them to take another dose, we got to check that medical school out. That's what he kept saying. I don't know what's causing it. Give her another dose. Well, it must be a bad medicine. Let's change the medicine and up the dosage. So one night on a Friday night, I came home from a football game in early September, and my wife was laying in the bed having grand mal seizures nonstop for an hour and a half. I want to talk about, man, that will mess your world up. It will mess your world up. So finally, our college minister, his wife was epileptic, and so he had seen seizures. I called him. I said, Rocky, I need you to come to the house. I don't know what's going on. He came over to the house. He walked in. He looked at her and said, hang on just one second. He pulled his phone out. I thought he was fixing to call 911. He said, Grady, you call 911. I said, what are you doing? He said, I'm videoing this. <laughs> he starts videoing. And I said, why are you videoing? I thought he was just kind of sick sense of humor. He said, no, you're going to want to show the doctor this. Made sense. So he's videoing it to show the doctor. We go to the hospital. Man, my world came to a stop. That's Friday night. On Sunday afternoon, they gave her some medicine that was supposed to stop the seizures. Now, there may be some of you in this room who are in the medical field, and you may understand what they gave her. I can't tell you what they gave her. All I know is later I found out they were supposed to give her this much, and they gave her that much. They were supposed to give her this much at this rate, but they gave her that much at twice that rate. And I would never call my wife crazy except today. She went crazy. She didn't know who I was, didn't know who anybody was. Next thing I know, they're coming and getting her, wheeling her to the ER, and I'm like, where are y'all going? They said, we're flying her to Oklahoma City now. And I'm thinking, or no, they said, we're taking her to Oklahoma City now. I'm thinking, okay, by ambulance. Oh no, the helicopter's on its way. And I stood there, and I stood outside the ER. The doc wouldn't let me go into the trauma room. I stood outside the, the trauma room looking through the little window, and I watched him yelling at people. It was like a scene out of ER. I, I watched him yelling at people, hollering at people, and shoving a tube down my wife's throat to keep her alive. They flew her to Oklahoma City, University of Oklahoma's medical center. We took off and got up there, and something wasn't right. We could tell something wasn't right. Well, the next morning, we got back. And the nurse, man, this is how good, how good God is. The nurse, my wife knew some sign language as a child. And the nurse she had overnight was the child of deaf adults. And he said, you know, she's really lucky to be alive. I said, why? What's going on? She said, she was choking all night and she wasn't getting enough air. And finally she communicated with me by sign language. And I discovered what it was. And so we adjusted the suction and got her air fixed. And so she was able to breathe. I'm like, man, God's good. For that six weeks from the moment she had her first surgery until the moment we discovered what was causing her problems, man, our world completely stopped. Things had been going amazing prior to that. Ministry was going. Family was going well. We just bought our home, just moved in. Things were going great. And then, man, something like that happened and just rocked our world. Well, in our text that we're going to look at this morning, we're going to see that the disciples were in a very similar situation. See, when the disciples were walking with Jesus, things had been going very well for them. In fact, in the passage just prior to what we're going to read, we're going to see that the disciples had seen Jesus heal many people. We're going to see that the disciples had seen Jesus feed a bunch of people. They must have been Baptists. They showed up for food. We're going to see that the disciples had seen all of that. And then all of a sudden, the disciples got some news that rocked their world. The disciples had been walking with Jesus. They had seen Jesus heal these people, feed the, feed the multitudes, and then they get this news, and the news they got was this guy who they thought was the anointed one, the Messiah, the one who would usher in the kingdom of God, the one who would set them free from Roman rule, that guy told them that he was going to die and that he would be resurrected. Well, here's the deal. They understood death... I mean, we all, understood, we all understand death. Death is kind of final, right? But Jesus told them he would raise again, but they couldn't quite grasp that because it wasn't something that was kind of a normal, everyday part of life, whereas people dying was kind of the end. It was a normal, everyday part of life. And so they got this news that the Messiah had to die. And then, after they got the news that the Messiah was going to die, Jesus kept saying, listen, if you want to save your life, you're going to lose it. But if you lose your life for my sake... You'll find it. You've got to take up your cross. And so all of a sudden, man, their world has been rocked. And they're like, what is going on? And I love the passage of Scripture that we're going to read because it starts off and Jesus says, that depending on your translation, it may say in eight days later or it may say in six days later or it may say about a week later. Jesus left them with that information that rocked their world 
for about a week. He let it soak in good before we get to the text that we're about to get to. You know, that's what God does. Sometimes in our life, we have those moments that rock our world, and we're asking God why, God how, God what, God when. We're asking all those questions, and God leaves us in that moment. You ever notice that when God leaves us in that moment, it causes us to become more dependent on Him when we're in the midst of the unknown? You ever notice that? When my wife was in all this, we were going through all these issues, man, I was crying out to God, God, why? But I noticed that I became more dependent on God during that time because I didn't have the answers. The doctor didn't have the answers. I had to trust that God knew what he was doing. Well, let's look, if you will, Matthew chapter 17. If you've got it, say, I got it. There you go. I like to hear people talk back. It's because I'm a youth guy. I'm used to it. God's word says, and after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and his brother John and led them up on a high mountain by themselves. And he was transformed in front of them, and his face shone like the sun. And even his clothes became white as the light. Suddenly, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. And then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it's good for us to be here. If you want, I will make three tabernacles here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And while he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud covered them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved son. I take delight in him. Listen to him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell face down and were terrified. Then Jesus came up, touched them, and said, Get up. Don't be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except him, Jesus alone. Listen to me this morning. There are times in life that things where we have to wait on Jesus, it's worth the wait. Because the supremacy of Jesus, the Messiah, crushes those areas of life that would overwhelm us. The supremacy of Jesus, our Messiah, crushes the areas of life that would overwhelm us. Now, I don't know if you tweet. I know some of you Facebook because y'all been all over mine. That'd be a good thing to put on Facebook or social media. The supremacy of Jesus crushes those areas of life that would overwhelm us. Well, how does he do that? Well, first of all, if you notice, he says, and Jesus led them up to a high mountain. See, Jesus is always going to do what Jesus is supposed to do. Jesus is always going to lead. But our responsibility to what Jesus does in in the leadership of our life is we need to walk with Jesus. We need to walk with Jesus. You know, that's not always easy. This past winter, I had the privilege of taking a group of our high school students up to Winter Extreme in Gatlinburg. I've never been to that part of the country prior to that trip. And so we get up there, and several of our adults who who were unable to go said, Grady, if you've never been to Gatlinburg, you've got to take the kids to the park. There's a waterfall. Take them back there and get their picture at the waterfall. I'm thinking, sweet, we'll do it. So the morning we get ready to leave, we get on the bus, and we load up and out by the bus. Let me explain. I'm not talking about a 15-passenger van. I'm talking about a 38-passenger freight liner. If you've ever been in Smoky Mountain National Park, there's not too many places you can turn that around. So we get on this bus, and we take off, and we go to the visitor center, and I walk in, and, you know, all my students, y'all know how students are, right? Like, I told them we were leaving at this time. And that meant they could sleep till five minutes before then, they thought. So I got students who were coming out in pajamas and house shoes. I mean, they looked like... I I hadn't been to the Walmart here, but I live in Tipton County. (laughs) So they looked like people from Tipton County going to the Walmart. You know what I'm saying? They dressed up. And so we get get there, and I walk in. Some of y'all are thinking, I know who he's talking about. So we walk in. And I go talk to the guy at the desk, the, the ranger, and I said, hey, listen, man, I'm not from around here, but I got these kids, and we want to take this picture. And I said, I was told there's a waterfall right behind the visitor center that we need to go to. And this guy stands up, and y'all, he's like six foot 40. He's huge. And so I look up, and I'm like, and he, he says, oh, no, that's good. He said, how big's your group? I said, our group's, you know, I think we got like 30, I think we have 48 or something like that. He said, okay, look. Now, some of y'all are wondering right now, how did you get 48 people in a 38-passenger Freightliner. I took two vehicles. So anyway, I look up at this guy and he says, oh no. He grabs a map. He says, you don't want to go to this waterfall. I said, why not? He said, it's raining and it's muddy back there. I'm like, all right. Now I didn't tell you, it's like 27 degrees and raining. Not really raining, more like a heavy fog with some rain. And so he says, you don't want to go here. You want to go to this waterfall. He says, listen, it's beautiful. It is a 2.6 2.6 mile round trip hike, but the trail is paved. 
Now see, where I'm from, I like to do some hiking, and when they tell me if a trail is paved, I'm thinking it's double wide like for two of those big ugly strollers that you can push around, and I'm thinking it's smooth, and it's paved, and it's level. That was not what he was thinking at all. We got down there, we parked, we started on this trail. I told my kids, come on, let's go. Some of them got house shoes, some of them got flip-flops on. Some of them got all kinds of different shoes. They are not dressed for this, for this adventure. I didn't know. I said, come on, let's go. So off we go. Well, the first hundred yards was pretty nice. It was almost as wide as me, and it was paved. And it was pretty flat. But then you made a little turn, and you looked up. And that trail just zigzagged back and forth and back and forth. There were mile markers every tenth of a mile. I'm not joking. It was 1.3 miles to the waterfall. 1.2 miles of that was uphill. But we got to the waterfall, man, saw beauty. We saw beauty at its finest. Up on top of the mountain, you look back out across the Smokies, man, you could see just a man, magnificent display of God's beauty. You know, the crazy thing was, I had some students who decided that the track to get up there was too tough. They decided the journey to get there was too difficult. They didn't go all the way to the top. They didn't walk all the way to the top because it was too much work. Can I tell you that walking to the top of this high mountain with Jesus for the disciples was challenging. You've got to think about the first century. They probably had sandals if they had anything. They're walking on a rocky road. Their feet are beat up. They're sweating. Those of you who have ever been up the side of a mountain, maybe you've been up Stone Mountain. Some of y'all heard we went to Stone Mountain and walked down the side. Maybe some of y'all have gone up it. Maybe you know how your quads start hurting when you walk up the side of a mountain. They walked up this mountain because walking with Jesus is not as easy as we like to think it is sometimes. See, we live in a world today that tells us that if we walk with Jesus, everything should be easy because we're trusting in him. But I'm here to tell you that walking with Jesus in Scripture was never identified with ease or with comfort. It was, however, identified with obedience. And as we're going to see in this passage, it was identified with when they walked with Jesus, they got to see the glory of God in a way that others didn't. I tell you, when we walk with Jesus, we get to see the glory of God in a way that others don't. The finite gets a glimpse of the infinite when we walk with Jesus. Walking with Jesus is tough. Well, well, how do I walk with Jesus? That's the next question. It's great that you can come up with all that, tell that great story, but how do I walk with Jesus? Well, we walk with Jesus by not stopping when it gets tough. We walk with Jesus by continuing on our faith journey even when we don't have the answers. The great thing about this, the disciples were going up on this mountain. They may or may not have known what was at the top. They may or may not have known what they were going to walk into. But yet they walked with Jesus. They kept on keeping on when it got tough to do that. You know, we live in a world today that teaches us that, man, we need to take the path of least resistance. Right? I mean, for crying out loud, one of, the, one of the fitness trends of the last 10 years was the shake weight. For just 10 minutes a day, you can shake this weight and supposedly you'll get toned, tight, and all that other fun. Come on now. I'm just saying, I don't know everything about anatomy, physiology, and kinesiology, but I know you hold a weight in this hand and shake for 20 seconds. It's not going to do a whole lot for you. Right? Why do we think our spiritual life's any different? Why is it that we think our spiritual life is so much different that when we walk with Jesus, we can walk until it gets tough and then we've got to stop or Jesus is dropping his end of the job? Listen, Jesus is going to lead because that's who he is. we just got to keep walking with him. Walk with Jesus. Well, how do I walk with him? Well, you walk with him by spending time in his word. Can I just tell you, all y'all going to hear a lot of that this morning. You're going to hear a lot of spending time in Jesus' word. And the reason you're going to hear a lot of it is because it's something we ought to do. Right? You've got to spend time in Jesus in the Word to walk with Jesus. Now, I know that there's a lot of times where we want to spend time in the Word and we get distracted. I put my cell phone in, my, in, in the office in there because I have this problem where it'll vibrate in my pocket or I have these phantom vibrations. 
Anybody ever have those where you think your cell phone's going to vibrate? And so when I have my phone in my pocket, I have phantom vibrations. You know, that's kind of what we are when we're walking with Jesus. We have great ideas and great intentions of following the Lord. And all of a sudden, we get distracted by things like our cell phone, by things like our television. Now, some of y'all are thinking, okay, Grady, you're talking negative about technology. Absolutely not. I love technology. I have almost every social media account you can possibly have because that's how I stay connected, plugged in, tuned in, and all those other things. I don't know what I'm going to do if the power ever goes out. But we, we walk with Jesus by removing the distractions and staying, staying right with him, even when it gets tough to do that. And it's not always easy to walk with him. Some of you were here this morning, maybe you've been walking with Jesus for a number of years, and you're beginning to ask the question, man, is it really worth it? I'm still having the same pain. I'm still having the same problems. I'm still having the same issues that I've had all of my life. Is it really worth walking with Jesus? And can I tell you, the disciples may have asked that question going up the side of this mountain, but when they got there, I can tell you they wouldn't trade it for the world because they got to see the earthly tent of Jesus' body pulled back, and they got to see his glory revealed. Cam Newton ain't got nothing on Jesus. Some of y'all are thinking, who is Cam Newton? <laughs> if, you're having, if you're having to ask, just ask a football fan. Walk with Jesus. It's not always going to be easy. Well, Grady, the Bible says, come to me because my yoke is easy as my burden is light. It is compared to the rest of the world's. I can tell you walking with Jesus and the heartache that you get or the pain you experience or the challenge you experience while walking with Jesus will pale in comparison in eternity to the choice of not walking with Jesus. You know, I, some of you have heard that I like to go to the gym a little bit. And so there's times I get up in the morning and I don't want to go to the gym. I'm tired. I don't feel good. I'm sore from the last time I went to the gym. But you know what I've noticed in my life? In those moments, if I push those feelings aside and get up and go ahead and do and go to the gym, I feel so much better afterwards than when I just kind of lay around. That's kind of the same thing in our spiritual life. When we get up and do what we know the Lord wants us to do and go ahead and walk with him, it may be a challenge at first, but we're going to find out that the blessing of walking with Jesus far surpasses the pain of not walking with him. But it's a choice that we have to consciously make. Well, not only do we need to walk with Jesus, but we need to look at Jesus. If you notice, it says in, in, in the scriptures that in, in verse 2 and 3, and he was transformed in front of them and his face shone like the sun. Even his clothes became white as light. Here's the deal. They looked at Jesus and for the first time, they saw him as he really is. And it happened because they looked at him. You know, a lot of times when we're thinking about looking at Jesus, it's easy for us to... Look at the Jesus that the world wants to present to us. You know, the Jesus who loves trees and the environment and the Jesus who loves everybody regardless of lifestyle choices. And some of you are saying, but Grady, that is Jesus. It is. But the Jesus that loves all of those people also doesn't love them enough to leave them in their condition. We go to the woman at the well to find out that he didn't condemn her, but he also didn't leave her in her sin-lost condition as well. That's the Jesus of the Bible. But see, we don't get to see that Jesus if we don't look at the Jesus in the full picture of Scripture. See, several years ago, or I guess it was last year, I took a group of students over to Arkansas. We went on this trail. We call it our Man versus Wild trip. And I had a couple of, I had a bright idea. I know it's hard to believe that a youth guy would ever have a bright idea. Let me tell you, I had a bright idea. I looked at the map, and I saw on the map there was a place where the trail was going to wind yonder ways. That's a Georgia word, right? The trail was going to wind yonder ways, but we could cut off here and go get ahead of them and scare them. So I took another guy, a couple guys, and said, let's go that way. So off we go. When we get to the point where we think that we should be able to get in front of them and scare them, the only problem is we're about 300 feet in a, in, on a cliff above them. We could see them walking down below us. We're taking rocks, trying to chunk it at them. Not that we wanted to hurt them or anything, but just scare them a little bit. And so we're throwing rocks at them, trying to get their attention, and all of a sudden, they never hear us. And so we think, we got to catch up. So we said, all right, well, we can't go down here. So I looked at the map again, and on up a little ways further, I, I thought, well, maybe we could get, go down there. I got there, and it was steeper. We had a problem. Now, for those of you wondering, eventually we caught up with them. Uh, but let me tell you what happened. 
we had a problem because the map we had did not show the topography of the land and we did not have a full picture of what we were looking at. Well, often that is exactly what happens with us in our walk with Jesus. When we begin to look at Jesus, if we're not looking at Jesus through the fullness of Scripture, we're not getting a clear image of who Jesus is. If our Jesus, if the Jesus that we understand comes more from a devotional book or more from a televangelist with a televangelist do or... And a bright smile in a big church. <laughs> then we're not getting the Jesus of the Bible. And so when we get the Jesus of the Bible, we've got to look at him. And the way that we look at the Jesus of the Bible is, again, I think I said this earlier, we've got to spend time in his word. You know, here's the great thing about Scripture. If you cut the Bible, it bleeds Jesus. If you cut the Bible, it bleeds Jesus. So we've got to spend time in it. We've got to look at Jesus and see him as he is. You say, well, Grady, that sounds simple. It is. But the other challenge that I've noticed, and I talk to students all the time, and I say, man, you've got to spend time in God's word. And, and this, when I was a student, I heard this. You've got to get up first thing in the morning. You've got to start your day off in God's word. Well, the reality is I've learned in life in 16 years of marriage, not everybody's a morning person. I won't make you all think which one of us is not the morning person, but I'll tell you, I am. And so... Um, there's times that people don't get up in the morning. The morning's not the time they're going to spend time in God's Word. I, I've seen people who they literally look like zombies in the morning without the whole eating flesh thing. They get up in the morning, they start kind of wandering around until they have their first cup of coffee. Y'all know what I mean. Man, if they were to open God's Word and start reading it, it'd look like Greek to them. Maybe that's not the best time. But you know what is, what is the best time is to set aside some time every day to say, I'm going to look at Jesus. I'm going to see him as he is. You know, when we look at Jesus as he is by spending time in his word, when we really look at Jesus as he is, a lot of the other things with which we deal will pale in comparison because we're going to see the glory of the resurrected king. And we're not going to worry about some of these other things. I, I don't know how you guys are, but I know in... Most Baptist churches, there are people who have different opinions than other people in that church. <laughs> what do you mean? Well, I mean, there might be somebody in here who thinks that red potatoes are better than white potatoes. You know, when we look at Jesus and see him as he is in Scripture, those things pale in comparison. Because you know what's really important? Jesus. Jesus. Look at him. The disciples got to see the glory of God in their presence. You know, while we don't get to see Jesus transfigured before us today, though, when we look at him and we see him as he is in Scripture, man, it gives us such a magnificent view of the glory and the wonder of who God is, it will blow our minds. In fact, it's too much for us to contain sometimes, and all we can do is do like Isaiah did in Isaiah chapter 6 and say, Woe is me, for I'm a man of unclean lips, because I have seen the glory of God. Sometimes you see God, you, you see Jesus as he is in Scripture, and all you can do is fall on your face before him because he blows your mind. Blows your mind may not be the best thing. Some of y'all may be thinking about blowing your nose, but... <laughs> It's better than rocks your world, but that's what I was thinking too. Man, he, he, it's amazing when you look at him. But you know, not only when you look at Jesus, I love the next passage. I love where Peter speaks up. We always give Peter a bad rap. We always pick on Peter for, you know, he gets out of the boat and then he looks down and then he, says, he denies Jesus. We always pick on Peter. I love what Peter says. Because not only do we need to walk with Jesus and we need to look at Jesus, but we need to focus on Jesus. Look at what Peter did. Peter said, Lord, it's good for us to be here. In fact, if you want, I'm going to build three tabernacles. Listen, that's the first Baptist building program in the Bible. But listen to this. Focus on Jesus. Peter was distracted by the very thing. See, Moses and Elijah represented the law and the prophets. And Peter was distracted by the very things that were to point people to Jesus. Oh, no. Surely that couldn't happen in 21st century Baptist churches, could it? Surely we couldn't get distracted by, by good things and miss Jesus. A couple years ago, my son and I had the opportunity to go up to Real Foot Lake in Tennessee and go duck hunting with a group of people. Now, I'd never been duck hunting until that time. And I, I probably run out of time, but I'm going to tell this story anyway because, well, I've got the mic. Um, 
I'd never been duck hunting. And so they told us, they said, there's 13 of us in this blind. And they said, now listen, because there's so many of us, don't shoot this way. Just shoot straight ahead. And I'm thinking, that makes sense. And so we're standing there, and this duck flies by. And I didn't shoot. And one reason I didn't shoot is because the guy sitting in the middle of us who was calling the ducks, that guy was amazing. He had this big neck. I mean, he could have been on Duck Dynasty. He had this big necklace thing full of duck calls, and he'd grab different ones and start blowing and doing all kinds of noise. And these ducks would fly by, and it was like they would put the brakes on at 200 feet in the air, turn, and like dive bomb us. And so I didn't shoot at the first few ducks because I'm like, I'm completely distracted. The very thing that was supposed to bring the ducks to me so that I could kill them, because that's what men do, the very thing distracted me and kept me from doing what I was there to do. Of course, then the other thing that distracted me was one of the guys had gotten tired of missing and so there's a duck flying across this way and I'm down here and he starts, doom, doom. And I realized he had one more shot left. <laughs> so I ducked. <laughs> My son was beside me. I grabbed him, pulled him down. I said, whoa, you know. He said, did I get you? And I said, no. He said, well, good. Last week I was hunting with a dude, and I peppered him in the back. <laughs> I hadn't been hunting with that guy again. I'd, I'd have a real hard time going home with my wife and saying, her saying to me, did you kill any ducks? No. But Patrick got shot. That would not go over well. But we got to focus on Jesus. The very thing that was there to bring the ducks to me distracted me. You know, that's what happens in, in our life with Jesus a lot of times. Man, I know what happens in my life. A lot of times I'll get so distracted with sermon preparation or I'll get so distracted with hospital visitation or I'll get so distracted with just the day, just being a dad. You know, you got kids and they're in different schools and they're in different grades and so you're trying to be a dad and sometimes it distracts me. The very blessings that God has given me can be a distraction from me having the time with Jesus that I need. I'd be willing to say I'm not the only one like that. I'd be willing to say we all need to focus on Jesus, don't we? I'd be willing to say that there's times that when we focus on Jesus above all else, that things like what translation of the Bible we read out of will pale in comparison. When we focus on Jesus, the color of the carpet doesn't really matter anymore. When we focus on Jesus and we realize that about 70% of Polk County, Cedartown, and the state of Georgia are lost and without Jesus and in need of a Savior, when we focus on that and know that Jesus alone is the only name among men given un under heaven given among men whereby men must be saved, when we focus on that Jesus of the Bible, you know, it really doesn't matter what time we start Sunday school or worship. It really doesn't matter if we wear a tie. Or it really doesn't matter what kind of music we sing because there's people who are lost and going to hell apart from Jesus. But we've got to focus on Jesus. Well, Grady, how do we do that? We keep the main thing the main thing. We focus on him. He's got to become central. You know, years ago, I don't know if you guys know this, but years ago, Baptist churches stood out as distinct because they put the pulpit in the center because the preaching of God's word would be central. And that was actually a, a distinguishing mark among Baptist churches years ago. I don't know if you guys knew that. I didn't know that until just a few years ago. So we focus on Jesus. Well, how do we focus on Jesus? Well, it's hard to focus on someone with whom you don't spend very much time. It'd be hard for me to focus on my wife if I never spent any time with her. She reminds me of that regularly. <laughs> Men, I'm sure I'm not the only one in here whose wife reminds you regularly, am I? Some of you are afraid to say amen right now because you're afraid she's going to elbow you. Wives, go ahead and pinch them and wake them up. We've got to focus on him by spending time with him. We focus on him by listening to him. See, we focus on Jesus, but we also listen to Jesus. Listen to what he says. He came over and he touched him and he said, Get up. Don't be afraid. Three or four years ago, we took a trip of students up to that, that mission trip I told you about earlier to Colorado. And we were out canvassing a neighborhood and we were passing out door hangers, advertising a block party and whatnot. And, you know, I. We were going to do this block party, give away some hot dogs and, and different things. And I, I do feats of strength. I break things. And so I was going to break some concrete, break a bat, and make a Coke can explode, all those kinds of fun, fun things, you know, because what else do you do when you're sitting around bored? And so I was going to share the gospel while doing all that. Well, so we're out, and we're knocking on doors. We're hanging door hangers. And we parked at this little park in this town. 
And I noticed when we got there that there were a couple of kids playing ball. And so I went up and began playing ball with them because that's what you do. You know, you want to introduce yourself. I go up and began playing ball with them. And then we left and went out and made our visits. And on our way back, I noticed that they were gone. And there was a couple of cars that kept going past us on the park. And I thought, man, that's weird. They kept really like staring us down. And I thought, that's kind of interesting. Well, my son said, Dad, come here a minute. So I walked over and he said, look at the tables. I started looking at the tables. Every one of the tables had been tagged by one of the local gangs. And I realize now why those cars were driving real slow as they were coming by and looking at me kind of weird. I was in the wrong spot. Didn't bother me too much, but I had about 30 kids that I started getting worried about. And so they're getting back, they're swinging, they're playing ball, and I'm like walking around real, hey, um, don't ask me why, but just go get in the van, do it now. Just go get in the van, do it now. First time in my entire ministry, nobody asked me why. They just all did it. I'm thinking, the Lord is in this. <laughs> Finally, and I won't go into all the details, but it, it, it got pretty scary for a couple of minutes. And finally, I get everybody loaded in vans and off we go. And here's the thing. I don't know what could have happened that day, but I know because of how scary some of the details were that it could have been really, really bad. But those students made a decision to listen, and as a result, we were spared some, some injury. We know what, when we listen to Jesus... When, we say, when he says, get up, don't be afraid. When you've been in the presence of Jesus and you've been touched by the master and he says, get up, there's no need to fear. Fear has no place here because our faith has overcome fear. Because the one in whom we place our faith has defeated the, the very source of fear. Now you think about that for a minute. The one in whom we place our faith, Jesus, has defeated the very source of fear, Satan. And so when we listen to Jesus and we get up and we do what Jesus has told us to do, then guess what? We got all power. And in Matthew, I love, I love the Great Commission in Matthew. We always like to quote Matthew 28 as the Great Commission. We always like to say Matthew 28 and 19. Go therefore into all nations. But see, if we start in verse 19, we really miss the start of the Great Commission. Because the Great Commission actually begins in verse 18 when Jesus says, all authority or all power is given to me in heaven and on earth. And it's in that power that he sends us out as his ambassadors, as his emissaries. And so when, he, when he, we say, listen to Jesus, and he says, get up, don't be afraid, can I just tell you, it's time for the church to get up and not be afraid. Well, Grady, what are we going to do with homosexual marriage if it gets approved? We're going to keep being the church. But what do we do about ISIS in America? I mean, that's terrible. You're right, it is. We're going to keep being the church. We're going to keep loving God, and we're going to keep loving people and telling them about Jesus. But, Grady, what are they doing? Man, they're putting people in prison overseas for, for following Jesus. Yeah, they are. Is that ever going to happen here? Maybe. What are we going to do if it does? I'm going to tell you, believers in Jesus, listen, we act like that's new. We act like people losing their heads over Jesus is a new thing. It's been happening for centuries. A couple of thousand years. Since John the Baptist. Can I tell you, when we listen to Jesus and we're obedient, the Lord's got, man, he's, he's, we're going to keep listening, we're going to keep loving, we're going to keep living. Because that's what he's called us to do. It's worth the wait. It's worth the wait. What we're going to see, Paul says it this way. Paul says, For I suppose that the glory that will be revealed to us is not even worth comparing to this present pain. Now, I don't know about y'all, but I'm thinking Paul was a man who was shipwrecked, he was beaten, he was snake bitten, he was stoned, and he was finally beheaded. I'm thinking if Paul could say that the glory to be revealed is not worth the pain that we're currently experiencing, I'm thinking if Paul could say that, then we ought to be able to say, Amen, hallelujah, praise the Lord, let's go get him. Well, I at least got an amen out of you. Amen. <laughs> I was worried there for a minute. Listen. The very supremacy of Jesus crushes those areas that would overwhelm us. I mean, this would have been an overwhelming thing for them apart from the supremacy of Jesus. But we walk with Jesus. We look at Jesus and see him as he is. 
We focus on him and don't get distracted. Man, that's the, that's, that is the tool of Satan is distraction. <clears throat> He'll distract us. Here in a few weeks, we're going to have a camp at our church. And we'll have about, I don't know, 700, 750 students from around the country come to our church for this camp. And it's always fun when we start putting this thing together because we're trying to think about the speaker, the bands, the logistics. And then somebody will come up with some question and you're just like, where did that come from? Like, we're trying to tell people about Jesus and you're worried about whether or not we're going to have ham or turkey on the sandwiches. You know what I mean? By the way, we're having ham for those of y'all who are wondering because turkey is significantly more expensive. <laughs> Somebody tells me all the time, I don't like ham. Well, guess what? I don't either. But for the difference in price, I'm going to eat ham that week. You know what I mean? You start feeding 750 mouths, and you start thinking, cheap. Cheap. But we get distracted. And all of you would, would agree with me by saying, but Grady, food is important. Absolutely it is. I'm a big dude. I like to eat. But it's not the main thing. Jesus is the main thing. We focus on him. Other things fall in place. And then let's listen to him. He's given us our martial arts. You know what I find oftentimes, and this is what's so crazy. I find a lot of times people stand around and say, I just don't know what Lord, I just don't know what the Lord wants from me. I don't know what the Lord's will for my life is. I just need the Lord to give me a word. I just need the Lord to speak to me. I bet if I went and I heard this pastor speak, or if I heard that pastor speak, or if I read this latest book, or if I did this, I bet the Lord would speak to me through them. Can I tell you that the Lord has already spoken? He's just waiting on us to act. The Lord's already spoken. The book of Hebrews talks about that, that in previous times, God spoke to his people in various ways through the prophets. But now, at the last times, he's spoken to us through his son. The Lord's already spoken. We just got to go do it. But we can't do it if we don't listen. You know, it's, it's paralysis by analysis a lot of times in our churches, right? We get paralyzed because we overanalyze what God's already called us to do. Instead of just going out and loving people and loving Jesus, we're like... Well, how should we do that? What should that look like? Well, I don't know, but it, when I see in Scripture, Jesus walked along and he talked to people and he loved people and he met their needs where he, where, where he could. And the disciples walked with people and they met people and they loved people and they met their needs. And crazy thing happened in Acts chapter 2. People got saved daily. I don't know if y'all heard what I said. People got saved daily because the church was just being the church. They were just listening to Jesus. Listen, this morning, there's some of us in this room who maybe you've never begun a walk with Jesus. Maybe you can't go up and see the glories of God because you've never started the walk with Jesus. And more than you need your next breath, you need to start that walk this morning by placing your faith and hope in Jesus Christ as your Savior. Maybe you're here this morning, though, you've trusted Christ, you've been walking with Jesus, but if, if we're just being real honest with, with one another, me and you talking, maybe you're not looking at Jesus. Maybe you've gotten distracted and you're looking over here, looking over there. Maybe you're chasing some other dream. Maybe you're following something else. Maybe you've allowed this post-Christian post culture to pull your affections away from Jesus, and you're not looking at him. You've become distracted, and you're not listening. And maybe this morning... Although you're a believer, maybe this morning it's time to come back home to Jesus. Maybe this morning there's some of you who are here and you're a guest and this is a place where the Lord would have you to serve and this would be a wonderful time for you to say, you know what, I'm going to be obedient to what God's called me to do. He's called me to be a part of his family, part, part of his church body. And this morning, I, I don't know that guy up there, he's kind of ugly, but I believe this is where the Lord would have me to serve and I'm, I need to unite with this church and the way they receive members. This would be a great opportunity in just a few moments you do that. And what's going to happen is I'm about to pray. And when I pray, uh, Jonathan and the band's going to come. And they're going to lead us in a time of invitation. And for those of you in this room who have never given your life to Jesus, man, more than you need to get out of here and get into the air conditioning or the humidity or wherever it is you're going, more, more than you need to go eat some ham and beans or more than you need to go eat some banana pudding, the Lord is in banana pudding. More than you need that, you need Jesus. And I'll be honest with you, we can put all that stuff back on the warmer in a little while if we all stay, take some time in here to do business with Jesus. 
Those of you in this place who you know Jesus, but man, you're not walking with Him. You're not, you're not listening to Him. You're not focused on Him. You're not looking at Him and seeing Him as He is in the fullness of Scripture. This stage is going to be open. These steps will be open. You can use it like an altar. And this will be a wonderful time for you to say, Lord, I'm coming home. I'm repenting. And I'm giving my life to You. I'm recommitting my, my life to Christ. And I'm going to be all in, sold out. I know y'all, most of y'all have heard that a couple of times. Um, I'm going to be all in. I'm going to be sold out. And I'm going to be passionate about following Christ. Those of you this morning who this is where the Lord would have you to serve, man, you come. I guarantee you there's some people here who would take you up, side counsel with you, make sure that you know Christ, and they'll present you to this church as a brother or sister in Christ. This morning, though, it'd be, we'd be remiss if we just heard some dude stand up and preach because we were looking for a pastor and we didn't let the Holy Spirit speak to our hearts. So when I pray in just a moment, you ask the Lord what it is he wants you to do. And during our time of invitation, you respond accordingly. Father God, we love you this morning. We thank you so much for the privilege of sharing your word. Father, we thank you this morning for the fact that you love us. You have a plan for our life. And God, while the enemy seeks to kill and to, kill and to steal and to destroy, you've come that we might have life and have it in abundance. And Father, for those in this room who have never experienced the life that Jesus provides, they've never begun a relationship with Christ. They've never begun walking with Jesus. Would today be the day your Holy Spirit convicts them and draws them to yourself and that they respond in faith and in obedience. Father, there's others in this room who have been walking with you for many years and they, they know you, Father. They, they've trusted Christ, but maybe they're at a place in their life where they've become distracted. They, they're not focused on you. They're not spending time in your word. They're not spending time in prayer. And God, this morning, would you speak to their hearts and would this be a time where they would repent and recommit their lives? Father, would you give them the courage to be obedient? Father, one of the hardest things for us to do as believers is have courage to step out and say, I've been wrong and Lord, I need to get things right. Because Father, we don't, we're, we're worried about what others will think about us. God, today, may we lose that distraction and may we focus solely on you. Father, there may be some here this morning who are guests, and this is the place you'd have them. God, would you give them the courage to be obedient to you this morning as well? God, we love you. We thank you. We look forward to what you're about to do during this time of invitation. We'll give you praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen. You stand right now. God's speaking to your heart. You come on. They're going to lead us in a time of response. You come right now. Don't wait. This altar's open.